Auntie, what's a social attack? Uh, well, I'll I like to. You're hacking categorize. the person. What does that even? Yeah, mean? Like, yeah, like exactly. As opposed, as opposed to hacking the the yeah. software, you're hacking the person. You mean I like I pull up at someone's house with a gun. I'm like, yo, give me your shit, or like you manipulate well, them a... into, <laughs> you know, like some sort of elaborate phishing scam. I think the like yeah. Tinder swindler shit, right? Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, that's that that comes to mind. Um, yeah. So, like, walk us through at a high level. Let's 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 get some terms out of the way. Like, let's define yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, I'd like to start by defining cybercrime as two distinct categories, which is the technical attack, which is what we discussed previously, and the social attack. And I think the biggest difference is that the social attack targets the computer's user. So mm. it's not really that material what operating system you're running or, or what's your browser of choice or if you have your updates in place because the attacker's attempt is to make you do something that's against your own interests by manipulating you using a bunch of different tactics. So we've seen, seen that most of the technical attacks against big organizations start with a social element. So right. they send a phishing email, for example, which is uh, an email that... Uh, pretends to be a legitimate email from, let's say, Apple or Google or Microsoft. And it tells you that there's an issue with your account and you have to log in to check check the issue out and solve it. So they give you a login link, which, which actually goes to the attacker server. And then you log in, which means that you How do you give know? The... Or you have to look at the URL? Well, that's one thing. The URL is a telltale sign and uh, you can look at the email sender if it's coming from a legitimate address. But There's no, a... I've gotten some of these. They look pretty good. The website that yeah. they bring you to looks exactly like Apple's website looks like. Yeah, because um, it's trivial to copy Apple's website. It's the, all, all the code is being delivered to your browser when you load the legitimate site. Then you just save it and host it somewhere else and put your own own little pieces of code there. And these are actually sold on the dark net markets. You can just buy a phishing kit, which contains ready-made uh, pages that then you just host. And these uh, criminals, they find uh, servers with, let's say, security flaws or vulnerabilities, and they are able to hack into those, and then they place their phishing kits on those servers. But the URL is usually a telltale sign that you can see that this is actually going to a Brazilian shoe shop, shoe shop somewhere instead of Apple ID. So you have right. to be pretty vigilant with that. Mm -hmm. But with, with the digital domain, it's, of course, possible to almost 100% impersonate a login page. So th this is one of the issues that we, we run into when we're trying to teach people how to avoid this kind of scams because it, it kind of depends on the fact that you actually know how a computer works and what's a URL and what's it supposed to look like. So so the, the learning curve to be able to spot this reliably and often is too high right now. Hmm. So that's that's the problem. And that's that's why social attacks tend to work. And this is just... So it's social just, attacks is getting someone to willfully give up personal fucking information. Yeah, or money, or or possibly act as a money mule, or invest in cryptocurrencies, or, or whatever. So there's a there's a bunch of end goals that the attackers want, depending on who they are and what's their what's their motivation for the attack. Because right. the, the FTC just came out with a with a report that the Americans uh, there's forty six thousand Americans that reported falling victim to different kinds of scams and they're, they're mostly cryptocurrency scams right now because that's the trendy thing <clears throat> like mm -hmm. new cryptos and get rich quicks schemes and things like that so i think the losses were hundreds of billions of dollars that people lost the median loss was two thousand and six hundred dollars which is a lot of money because that's the median a lot of people lost way more Hmm. Uh, so, so scamming, scamming on the internet is is starting to be a big problem, both for just regular citizens and and also corporations and other organizations. It's, it's. I mean, you bring up the crypto thing. It, it's, it's interesting. Like, uh, I wouldn't say the tide is turning, but you look at all these cryptos that that are losing their value. There was a shitload of scams, and you just mentioned there was this whole report that came out about it. Yeah. Um, but it's starting to resemble a cult, in my opinion. The whole thing—it's just—it uh, has has all the hallmarks of a Ponzi scheme, like all of them. Some some nakedly, so they even had Ponzi coin, 
which is called Ponzi coin. <laughs> and the point was that you get in early and then you get rich and all the suckers who come in late are left holding the bag. And I think under the... Is that exactly the, what happened? Is that exactly yeah, what that, happened with Ponzi well, coin? That's exa- <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what happens uh, with a lot of cryptos. So it seems like there's a lot of like techno babble surrounding all this this supposedly groundbreaking technology and i i suppose they probably are onto something and there might be might be real world applications for this stuff one day but for now it seems like people are getting way poorer just messing with it and it's 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 treated as a investment opportunity like anything else but i'd just rather like to see see it treated as gambling which it essentially is that's so. a good that's an excellent point I, look i mean i think there are as you well know re, like good real world applications for you know decentralized the decentralization of information but it is not there's a difference between investing in you know the s p 500 and, or whatever and publicly traded stocks or playing the stock market and playing, yeah. with, playing with these cryptos which are in some cases, totally unregulated. And that, you know, I mean, but outsized risk, outsized reward is, is one mm-hmm. argument that people tell themselves, oh, why would I put my money in, you know, uh, some, you know, index fund that, you know, return or hopefully will return a couple percentage a year when I could make, you know, 10, 15, 1,000 times my money buying some fucking cartoon, you know, J- like meme, meme, <laughs> meme coin or something. Yeah. My friends... I had well, actually, never mind. But I had a couple of friends <laughs> who made like joke coins, and you know they didn't make any money, but they just did it. Yeah. I don't think they made any money, um, but I, they just did like did it for fun to see what it would be like to start a cryptocurrency thing. Or maybe they were trying to make money. I have no idea. Um, yeah. I I wasn't involved in this. Um, well, yeah, when they call creation. you for, yeah, when they call you up for an investment opportunity, just pass because you're going to lose that money probably. <laughs> well, you but know, yeah, I I'm have a- had friends. I, I, I do have had friends who uh, went to uni with me and they're all like, you know, crypto heads or crypto gods or crypto bros or whatever the fuck you want to call them. And like some of them are making money. Some of them left yeah. six figure jobs at some of America's largest companies. Um to sure. do crypto sure. and I don't know. You know what? I want to let's just we could talk about crypto forever, but it's not interesting to me. The social hacking is. So we talked about phishing. What about actually, you know, the Simon Leviev and this whole Tinder swindler type shit? Yeah, like, uh, that was how a... that work? Convincing someone to like fucking he would he convince these women to give to like open credit cards in his name and stuff. I mean, yeah. do you deal with this this type of social attack too or are you mostly focused on like the phishing element? Well, there's been or a Or not deal a, with, are you interested in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interested in. I, I talk about this publicly every once in a while cuz I, I do do some trainings for people how to avoid the falling victim to these kinds of things. This is not something I'm professionally involved now beyond that because it's really not in my job description anymore but i do have a have an interest in that and tindler swindler is a is a netflix documentary about i think it's simon leviev or something this israeli guy who scammed a lot of a lot of women out of their savings and and had them take out loans and give him all the money and it, it was a we call these romance scams and it's a it's a it's a version of the advance fee fraud where the victim is lured into a a relationship with the attacker. So the the difference, uh, what made the Tindler swindler case so interesting was that he he actually met the victims and spent time with them because a a lot of Mm. these attackers are originally uh, from from, uh, abroad, other countries. Uh, There's a big industry of this in in Nigeria and and some other West African countries. So it's, it's this again is hard to attribute to any uh, any single country so this happens from all, all over the world but those countries are notorious for this kind of scam and they they usually rule, lure the victim into a long distance relationship they set up a fake persona a profile 
uh, American soldiers has been a very, very common one. They say that they're on deployment in Afghanistan or something like this, and they start a very intense, long-distance relationship with the victims and have the how victim... they just DM someone like yeah, WhatsApp know? and and sometimes phone calls and and things like that, mostly text, and just just bomb them with texts and have them fall in love with them. And, but it's that's uh, not that easy. I, 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 it's not so easy to fall in love with someone. I mean, what's the psychological yeah. factors at play here? Like, if someone DM me, "Hey, beautiful," I'd just be like, "All right, this is fake." I mean, I am. <laughs> I like to think that I, you know, have nice golden locks. I put in conditioner before this interview. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. But like, you know, <laughs> one argument would be that I, I'm not saying I subscribe to this. I obviously feel bad for you know, some of these women from the movie, The Tinder Swindler, but there are those who would argue, and I can see the merits to this argument, that these pe- these these women got what were coming to them because, like, how stupid do you have to be to open credit cards in the name of some guy you met once? Um, like, what's the well, psychological factors at, 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 at play here? Like, I mean, well, because everyone wants to be yeah. loved. Every, people are lonely. Do they prey upon particularly vulnerable people? Um, I mean, they must be adept at identifying um, those who are likely to fall prey to their scams. Or maybe they just throw, you know, truck paint at the wall everywhere and see where it sticks. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I think it's probably just an effect of casting a very wide net. If you just message a hundred people every day for several days, you're going to contact a lot of people. And if one or two of those take the bait and message you back, then you start messaging with them. And these people, they have a playbook on how to run this scam and they're very experienced with it. And it's usually, usually, it's a serial scam and they scam several people at the same time. So they know how to communicate and how to, uh, how to charm the victim properly. And, and usually the, the common thing with the victims is that they are in a situation in their life where they are vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. The thing is that the, the victims aren't dumb. It's, it's not like they, they don't have the, the intelligence to spot a scam or, or, that they're undereducated or that they have some other deficiencies. That is, that's not usually the case because the studies on this show that the victims are are more female than male and usually they're, they have some education and they have uh, have financial means, but they're, mm. they might be widowed or divorced or lonely for other reason or, or have health issues that limit their, their ability to meet people in the real life. So what happens there is that they they might have a very idealized idea of what kind of a partner they want and the attackers just give them enough cues so that they can use their own imagination and hopes to fill out the picture and this mm. this comes up in the interviews with the victims that they say that they they thought that they met their their dream guy and every little detail that pointed towards the other direction was strategically ignored because mm. well you know, you're not uh, at your smartest when you've just fallen in love. You know <laughs> how that happens. You you don't really make make the most rational choices or act in the most yeah. rational manner, which is good right. for the procreation of the human species, but not <laughs> very good for avoiding yeah. avoiding acting against your own right. self interest. It's like you know when you sort of get into that state of mind that you build this fantasy of this perfect person who's just out out of your reach and just this is just this one thing you have to do to get them to you and they usually follow a pretty pretty standard storyline so they're usually the guys that they pretend to be are are widowers with teenage children so there's two two big big like let's say attractants to people who are a bit older they meet somebody let's say a man in his 50s who's never married that's a bit of a red flag but if they're a widow that's a, that's the opposite they're emotionally vulnerable they've lost their wife and they're looking for love but they've been let's say pre-approved by the female sex already they've already had a big relationship which means they, did, they didn't even mess it up and got divorced or anything like that they're a widow yeah. so that turns them into a victim and elicits a sympathy response from the uh, the actual victim of the scam. 
So mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of psychological manipulation at play there. But and, what do they say? Like, I need money to for the airline yeah. ticket to come and visit you? Or like, how do we go from Facebook relationship to, or whatever platform relationship well, to transfer of funds? Well, that's that's usually usually the scam that they they tell that they're coming to the country. For gas or for well, airline, airline fares, airline fares, or or some kind of uh, customs official things, and and all sorts of stuff starts to happen to them, and they are not able to access their their considerable funds at that moment, so they need help from their new lover. So it's it's usually the the common scams are that something happens to their children and mm. they they need money for medical expenses or that they're they're trying to get some leave from the army base that they're working in and they need to fly to the country of the victim's origin and meet them and start spending the rest of their lives together but now there's a there's a surcharge of 3000 euros to get your papers stamped or something like that so they send copies of the paperwork and they tell that I'm going to pay you back once I get to get get to you and we can be together and and people usually when they depart from their first money they're skeptical more skeptical than when they ask for more because when you get to the habit habit of giving it's really hard to stop because it, it turns into this kind of a good money after the bad situation like when gamblers can't quit they just think the the big win is just right around the corner and w- would be dumb to stop now and sever ties so when you're a hundred thousand in the hole, it's it's quite easy to just send two thousand more, because you want to keep the fantasy alive that maybe they are who they are, say they are, and they're going to be with you in a minute or in a few days, and then you'll get all your money back. That's, so it's a, gone... that's an excellent point. It's a sort of cognitive bias. It's like yeah. just a little bit more, just a little bit more, and once they've given all this money, I mean, I would imagine there's also an element of like. How are they going to explain to their friends and their family that they just, you know, if 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 they if the guy requests you a hundred thousand in the hole and the person requests just two thousand more and then they can't come and visit you without the two thousand more, it's like how are you going to explain to all your friends and family that you shelled out six figures to a stranger on the internet? Yeah, um, exactly. It, it's like a, a, an embarrassment thing of like, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's there's that and. Some of these people have loved ones or family or friends who've actually told them that this is a scam and this is a classic scam. So you're falling a victim to a scam and, and well, the victim is in love and they refuse to see the facts. And they, they're interpreting everything. And the answer is just like, you don't know this guy. He's for real. I've been talking with him for six months and nobody would scam me like this. And then they take out a loan of 100000 You don't know him somebody. like I know him. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, well, like... We've all been there. So your bros tell you that that girl's not good for you. And you're like, no, she's perfect. She's my angel. And then a year later, you're like, damn, bro, you were right. <laughs> like, right. You know, it was, yeah, uh, you're clouded judgment. Peaky, Peaky Blinders or whoever. I don't know. Probably from some great literary reference. But the way it yeah. trickled down to an uneducated fool like me would be through the Peaky Blinders, which I haven't even watched. I just saw a internet meme on one of those like movie quote pages is like there's only one thing that can blind a man as smart as you tommy love and yeah i think that's penny says that to tommy um it's yeah. true like there's only one thing that makes a smart man dumb love or a smart you smart woman in this case dumb is, is or a uh, bottle of whiskey it, or because <laughs> um, most of these victims were of Simon Leviev were not most of them. They were all women. He preyed exclusively on, on I think, a particular demographic. But you know what I don't understand is I haven't like looked into this. Um, but uh, he continued even after this documentary came out. He continued like he's still doing it. Like where is this money coming from? It's such a fucking mystery. I mean, I don't. Know. Yeah. Well, the thing is that, well, I'm, I'm not a psychiatric professional, but I think this is a pretty clear-cut case of a psychopath, and they can be quite convincing. No, but what about the victims, and, man? Like, there's a yeah, documentary well, made about this fucking guy. It's all lies, man. <laughs> that's that's what the he explanation. Says, like, yeah, well, that's that's what he says, and he says that I have powerful enemies that are out to get me, and they've, they've been able to... <laughs> 
you know how it is with the fake news and everything and this is just a smear job and, and things like that so and these women are vengeful and you're my true love and you know they just sweet talk their way out of it i hope and i'm pretty sure that the netflix documentary actually made his operations a lot harder than they were before because he was a serial scammer because he he moved from victim to another and just paying for his lavish lifestyle with the funds that he managed to stole from the previous victim yeah. Uh, he was in contact with several women at all times and he had he even had an accomplice this this bodyguard type whose name i'm spacing on but who was who was oh. obviously in on the scam and helping yeah. him yeah fabricate this stuff so i can understand that somebody who's operating in the real world like that and with psychopathic tendencies is able to let's say believably act like he's in love or in a relationship with you so that's that's a even even more dangerous situation because he was flashing a lot of cash to begin with. Sorry. So, yeah, yeah, and he was flying private jets and dressing in really expensive clothes, and he had all these watches and and cars and everything, yeah. and he paid paid for all of that with the with the money that he scammed from the previous victim, just to mm. get the next one lured up. So, I don't know what's going on with him right now but i know that he got convicted in finland of all the places because he had a victim here also oh so, really yeah convicted yeah, of what so so we can't go to europe because of schengen shit right like wouldn't he um, be extradited i think he got I mean, convicted of of fraud or aggravated fraud or something like that but the finnish finnish justice system is such that it's very rare to go to prison so you actually really have to have a heroic effort to end up behind bars here so I think he was just probably given a sentence and then then extradited from the country. You know, so. I think well, extra he he was never in. Oh, he he went to court in Finland. There was a yes. trial. Yeah, he was oh. in Finland and he went to court here because he had a Finnish victim ah. who actually filed a police report and the police investigated and caught him and, and he was they got convicted. Him. Oh, I think that was at the end. Yeah, that he landed in Helsinki or. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't remember the exact details. Um, yeah, me right. neither. It's been a while since I saw the documentary, but but I said let's say the theme was was uh, pretty common to all all of these scammers. So we've had these before the internet, of course, but uh, scamming serially several people at once in an industrial scale—that's new. And that's yeah. totally enabled by the internet, because we. In, in policing, we used to talk about international crime, and international crime, in my mind, is like Latvian uh, criminals coming to Finland to raid summer cottages and steal boat motors and things like that. But global crime is is what internet brought us, and that means that transnational the, the, crime, yeah, 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 cool. and it's a borderless crime essentially, because because the attackers are able to attack uh, Finnish victims from an internet cafe in Lagos. So that's that's wasn't possible 20 years ago, but it's possible now because doing that via letters is pretty hard. But doing that via WhatsApp and Facebook and, and all that stuff, that's just makes it the barrier of entry is pretty low. Right. And there's right. there's millions and hundreds of millions of possible victims out there. Well, hopefully not the listeners of this podcast. Hopefully everyone Whoa. comes away sufficiently educated. <laughs> yeah, I, I should hope so or somebody just sending right now a very frantic text message to their boyfriend <laughs> so yeah that's that's one possibility but but the thing is about the victims like any one of us could be a victim of of any kind of crime to be to be honest so this mm. of course requires vigilance and skepticism and not not everybody is born with that instinct in them and when when the attackers use the best methods that they have available which they've honed over years of doing this over and over again they can actually be really persuasive right and the and the people people who fall fall victim to this uh, i tried to see i actually went into into this question a while ago i just i had this theory that they must be must be more agreeable than other people that they agree to send money to somebody that they've never even met but that actually turned out to be not true they were more open but not more kind they were actually less kind than other people in a comparison group which was a surprising finding but the thing that they found what they 
these people usually had was some tendency for addiction behavior and mm. and gambling behavior. Right. And they had yeah, and Monica Witte who wrote the uh, who has done a lot of research on this subject said that they they seem to have this kind of a near win uh motivation that they come really near to meeting the person or getting their money back and that motivates them like a gambler getting 20 on a blackjack table and the house house yeah. drawing 21 mm -hmm. it's a loss but it doesn't feel like a loss it feels like a near win but right. that just like that almost that seems there. to just yeah almost yeah. there we factually you weren't you you lost and that's it so <laughs> but but this this just going to the airport and getting all doled up and just waiting to meet the victim uh i mean the scammer and then they never show up because of course they don't that kind of reinforces the behavior which is weird because you think that that would be that would be something that would drive people away from it but they actually set up these scams just to get the people more emotionally emotionally involved in the relationship mm. and the yeah and the thing is that in a lot of scams people lose money but in in this situation it's really hard to cope with the fact that you've been scammed because you don't only lose money, you also lose your relationship. So a lot of the victims said that the the worst part of it was that they were actually in love with the imaginary person. And mm. now they, they don't have that person anymore. So in essence, that person just died. So that was usually the the biggest source of grief. And it even drove some people to continue the relationship, even though they knew that the other party was a scammer. And there was a there was a, a sort of a continuation scam because when they've been exposed some of the scammers went so far that they told the victims that they actually had been scamming them and they want to come clean because during doing this i actually fell in love with you <laughs> so they they kind of take off the mask and still continue and the victims are so hooked uh not necessarily Sorry, say that again did you say they after finding out that the person is a hacker the hacker's yeah. like, oh, I fell in love with you. And then they actually continue with the real relationship or it continues to be a, a supplicant. Um, uh, well, they continue stuff. the scam. They continue the scam. They just, they just, well, it's a, it's a basic, basic, let's say transference behavior that you have, have all Wait, these no, feelings. I, I, no, help me, yeah. not the psychology. What actually happens? You have well, they, what, the, what actually the victim yeah. and then the guy and then the guy announced the, um, the the attacker. guy pretending to be someone else the attacker is like says oh by the way i'm actually not who i say i am but we should continue with our relationship anyway or yes. how does this happen well exactly like that they they just unmask themselves as, as somebody else that they said they are but then they say that they they actually fell in love with the victim during the scam as themselves and they'd like to continue the relationship and the victims sometimes feel that this is this is acceptable to them and they they still they they feel that they've why would they ever admit to that well if they're caught uh, if if the proof is uh, proof is out there oh if it's, oh, if it's, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. if the victim confronts the attacker and yeah, says exactly Look, man this is not adding up yeah exactly or, or they've been able to to get their right real identity for some reason or or the other so it's uh, i don't know the details of these situations i just know that some of the victims are in such a state of mind that they're they're even willing to continue a relationship with somebody that they know are a scammer so that's that was kind of surprising to me because when you think about this uh in an objective way you think that the scam is being exposed now and that means that the victim is surely going to cut uh, cut ties and get out of the situation but it could be that the attacker is holding 200,000 euros of their money. So they might think to themselves that, okay, he says he's in love with me. Maybe I can talk him into sending me my money back. Right. So there's there's this pretty con convoluted and complicated psychological dance going on there. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the attackers are going to use this to their advantage. It's interesting. And it's yeah. like deeply disconcerting. And then now it's getting even worse. I mean, let's talk a little bit about, um, let, excuse me, that was illegible. That was like a Joe Biden type sentence. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was in the foothills of the Himalayas. It's like, Joe, what are you talking about, bro? Um, 
just start doing the invisible yeah. handshakes next. So. Oh, yeah, exactly. Excuse me, anybody. Um, so maybe actually I'm just, this is probably a step too far, but maybe I'm just talking, maybe you're imagining, maybe you're a figment of my imagination, and I'm just like in a room alone talking to a blank screen. I could be hallucinating. I don't think I am, but it's possible. Uh, maybe you're one of these attackers, and you've convinced me that you're on T, but you're not. You're yeah. actually Simon Leviev with a lot of plastic surgery and, and, and a larger beard than I remember from the documentary. <laughs> but um, in all seriousness, you know, I would imagine that, you know, deep fakes, AI, all this kind of shit are poised to disrupt the uh, impersonation racket. Um, by making it easier and mm -hmm. easier. Like maybe you just have a bot that fucking runs a thousand of these games at the same time that has natural language processing and that is, you know, really good at it. Or maybe you have someone like uh, creating like a virtual fucking avatar of themselves. I don't know. Um, yeah. Is AI uh, and deep fakes like disrupting this landscape at all? Uh Probably in the near future. Doing that in the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's one worry I have, and I've been playing around with this idea for a while because it seems that there's um, machine learning has been a, such a. I think it's been underappreciated of what it's actually capable of doing and how it's poised to to disrupt a lot of things that we we take for granted for now. So short version of what it is it's just you train a computer algorithm with some source data to be able to create new data based on inputs or cues so we've seen this being applied to uh, language for example there's the open ai project called gpt3 which mm. is um, uh, which is the generative pre-trained transformer and that's the third version of it so it's a, it's a language model that has been taught with a huge amount of information. And that's that's first prerequisite was that we have all this information available. And what is internet but written text and cat mm. photos, of course, but mostly written text. So you can use that to tell an algorithm how sentences are usually structured. And it, it can find themes from those sentences. And just pouring all this data into this algorithm produces scarily convincing results because you can do this model you can use this model to to write a college paper on any subject that you give it you can use it to actually convert ideas into code and just have it program and this is kind of just taking a peek into what human computer interaction is going to be in a few decades because i think or all center. of this that yeah, I don't know yeah. That. Well, well, they'll have the first working prototype sooner, but when it's in, in consumer consumption, that's going to take called? a while. What is this called? Auntie, this is not my area. What is it? What is this called? Uh, which one? It's it's uh, machine learning. Basically. Well, oh, just machine learning in general. I thought it was mentioned like a specific. Oh yeah, this this the GPT three. That's the yeah. the language model that I'm using as an example here, but it's only one of several, and it's hmm. uh it's a machine learning model that's designed to create language and generate language. Mm. So uh, I think this one and the the uh, uh, the deep fake videos are also used using these same kind of models because it's it's pretty pretty hard to actually just go frame by frame doing this by hand, but you can train a computer model on what faces look like and how heads move and just feed it thousands of hours of video and it can start to pick out the signals in the random noise and understand, okay, this is a face. We can see this in the, all the facial recognition algorithms, even on our phones right now. You can search your own name and find pictures of you because it can actually tell the difference between you and somebody else's face just by the yeah, details. Yeah, well, there's a faces feature on the iPhone. They identify yeah. you and all your friends. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it knows me and both my friends. So yeah, it's actually quite impressive and that technology has been there for a while but just being able to to get this this to the essence of what is in a picture is is quite powerful because we can train train an ai uh, sorry I said ai i mean machine learning these are distinct concepts but we can train a machine learning model to understand 
and find cats from pictures, for example. Mm, but you sure. can't ask it to define a cat or just define the experience of petting a cat or, or any, any of the other of the qualities of the cat. It has no understanding of, of the concept of cat. There's yeah. no, no deep understanding of the innateness of catness and what it means to be a cat and what you can expect from a cat. But it can yeah. determine if an object in a picture is a ferret or a cat with like 99.7% accuracy, which is better than people. Right. So it's, it's pretty limited, but very powerful. But when we apply it to written text, we can actually hold up a conversation with a GPT-3 model. So you can tell it, ask it something, and it can answer you. And the operator can guide it and, and set themes and things like this. Like you could actually, and you can uh, write bots for Twitter that can have some kind of a conversation that makes about as much sense as anyone on Twitter makes, because it's just mimicking the regular responses to your questions, for example, it just goes through a hundred million tweets and then it draws a simulacrum of the average answer to your question, for example. Right. So, so combining this technology with real time deep, te deep fake technology will at some point allow us to use this kind of stuff to build very convincing human avatars online and have those actually pass for real humans. And that's kind of scary to me because that means that these social attacks, which are now limited to actual human operators, can be scaled up indefinitely. indefinitely. So you can have an Amazon Web Services server farm running 100,000 100, machine learning model bots, which all learn from each other while they're, they're doing it scamming hundreds of thousands of victims around the globe. So that's that's kind of the, the future that worries me on the social attack sphere, because what really limits us now is that if you want to scam somebody, you can't really run a lot of those scams parallel, even though you're very good at it or experienced at it. But if you when you start having like five victims at the same time, it gets unwieldy for even one attacker. And that limits the scale and opportunity of the attackers. It means that they have to hire and train new people and it's still limited. Of course, the individual damages are pretty, pretty high. But if you're able to scale this 10,000 times, you can take much smaller sums of money. You can just convince somebody to send you 100 euros or, or maybe, maybe be able to have them invest in your new crypto scheme or, or whatever, whatever, or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Whatever it is. And, or just give out your password and email address. And, and, and the automation of, of the social, social plane is, is highly worrisome. But uh, of course I see, see a lot of opportunity and, and promise in this technology too. But, but this one, this one I think is a bit underappreciated at this moment. The risk. Is yeah. Underappreciated. Yeah, so the potential the risk. What's the solution? Uh, I mean, how do you, yeah. I mean, you train, you said you train people like, don't be fucking stupid. Don't give out your password on the internet. I mean, that's one, well, that, like, I know it's not about being stupid. There's older people who don't know how to use the internet or, or vulnerable demographics, but like, it's not yeah. nearly as simple as I've reduced it to the one sentence. <laughs> don't be stupid. No. So yeah, what's, well, that's... how does it get more complicated? Well, not being stupid is a good guideline, and but I think, I think one of the things that people need to be vigilant of is that scams actually happen, and they they need to educate themselves on them and understand how the mechanics work. And there are some common red flags to all scams, which is usually usually that you can spot the situation where somebody's trying to influence you, like you you get an email that actually makes your heart race. That should be the first red flag that there's information that is making me emotional which is priming me to be scammed so that's one thing the other one is there are technical solutions like multi-factor authentication which is something that everybody should be using and almost nobody is they're rolling it out in companies now but protecting your personal accounts with this is also actually doable now and it's um, the multi-factor authentication is is that you have your username and you have your password and then you have a third factor that authenticates you. It's, it can be yeah. 
an SMS to your phone or a, or a physical hardware token or whatever. There are other options to it, but that just means that if somebody gets a hold of your username and password, they will still need access to the third factor to be able to log into your account. And this stops pretty much most of the, the phishing attacks out there. It doesn't protect you from bad investment advice, advice from Twitter bots, though. For that, you just need to know know what <laughs> how to act when you get presented with opportunities like that. Yeah. But one thing is just just being skeptical of all this techno babble and bullshit that's being fed to people. Like there aren't a lot of crypto millionaires there out there. There's a few for sure, but but not a lot. But there is a lot of people who are like in crypto poverty right now after losing everything on that gamble. So those those guys don't get interviewed on Crypto Daily or or get their own blogs or or by Twitter or whatever, but they are out there and those human stories of losing everything to a scam are usually not stories that people are happy to tell about themselves. So they right. tend to be on the sidelines. You don't hear about that. So there's also a bias there. You only hear about the winners. Hmm. It's it's like with anything. I mean, there's. For every, you know, I was talking with uh, Andy Bell, he's a professional poker player on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, and we were talking about the 1849 phenomenon, which was that uh, during, you know, gold rush, like the people who make, during any gold rush, the people who make the money are the ones selling picks and shovels. Like, sure, yeah. a few guys are, a few guys are going to strike it rich um, and find some gold, but most of the people going, you know, are going to end up, you know, with their dick in their hand and not, you know, not, not a block of gold, yeah. um, not much else. <laughs> and so who's to profit from all of this? The one, you know, readily fucking selling shovels to all of these, uh, willing buyers. Yeah, um, exactly. So it's like same thing with crypto, uh, the crypt, the crypt, Influencers, or whatever the fuck you want to call them, like the crypto influencers, the little finance fin, fin, fin influencers, I think they were called. I read actually recently <laughs> that there's like some new legislation preventing people who haven't done like you know proper licensing exams from offering financial advice to to people on the internet. And I was con I was conflicted about that because on the one hand, like there are a lot of scams. But on the other hand, like teaching teenagers basic like accounting I, shouldn't be a crime. I don't know. I have I, I talk about that because mm. I haven't read into the details of that uh, particular legislation in Australia. But like, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Is is uh, or I can understand what you're saying. It's like there are a few crypto millionaires, but um, like exercise discerning judgment be be discerning maybe is the advice yeah and 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 be be mindful of the fact that if you throw money at a crypto that's that should be money that you can afford to lose because there was yeah. uh, there was just a, a total implosion of one of the so-called stable coins a while back and uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago called terra and its sister coin luna and actually mm -hmm. I do a weekly podcast in Finnish with a couple of buddies about mm. lo uh, like current cyber issues. And I was trying to read up on it. And it seems like you, you jump into a specialist forum filled with its own lingo and all the words. And it just, they don't even make an effort to explain what all of this is. It just it seems like there's a, there's a speech code that needs to be cracked first. And then when you start speaking the code and understanding all the concepts, then you're you're in the inner circle and it makes it look very professional. They have really nice websites and everything and they they have all these high flying concepts and it just makes you feel that these people are way smarter than I am and they understand this stuff so I could trust them. So it's a bit of an offshoot of, of our trust the science mindset in the West right now. And right. just trust just, the science. Well, yeah, that that what it feels like because it's it's no, all very yeah. very <laughs> very, very well, techno it's a babble. Deference I mean. to no, it's a deference to an authority, an official sounding, yeah. looking exactly thing. It's like everyone's using these big fucking words, and you're like, oh, well, then they must know what they're talking about because I don't. But that's yeah. not the case. 
Exactly. Um, it's, it's like the I doctor always... speaking Latin to you. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, you must know your shit because you know all these words. But what actually ended up happening with it, they had this elaborate like auto balancing scheme where they were trying to ensure that the Terra coin is always pegged to the dollar. But there was a big sale event which triggered triggered a catastrophic meltdown of the whole whole crypto token, which ended up ended up becoming worthless in a couple of days. And a lot of people lost a lot of money. And there were tweets which in in hindsight don't didn't age so well but somebody tweeted about how they 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 put a second mortgage on their house and put it all in terra and how how their dumb girlfriend is telling them to sell but she doesn't understand crypto like i do and just really 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 bad stuff and now now that guy's broke like seriously broke and it's just sad. same yeah, thing with the, well, the gamestop the gamestop it, people a lot, some people made a ton of money um, yeah, it would be sadder again, without all the arrogance. To, the arrogance and the the well, look, the crypto bros. I mean, that's a trope, and some people fit it. But like the 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 guys like throwing around all these lingo, whatever. It's sort of like a cult, as you said before. It's like anything else. Can I be a part? Everyone wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And yeah, you have this large online, completely decentralized community of, you know, <laughs> I don't mean to read into this too much, but maybe like disaffected males. You know, um, mm. not, I don't want to go as far as incels, but like you have. I'm sure they feature prominently in the crypto game, though. Just to prediction um <laughs> like uh, yeah, hard to say Don't... yeah no but like you ha you're a part of this community and you're all speaking the same language and you're on the same reddit sub threads and you all are like circle jerking each other into believing that this is like official and cool because you're ever suddenly mm. everyone speaks latin or you know or, or yeah. whatever crypto version of latin but it is you know it is sad, like when someone loses their mortgage. Like that's that that's that's gut wrenching. Um, well, I think I the guess, thing is that yeah, you're in on the secret that the normies aren't. I think that's that's a pretty big that's, deal. That's, that is precisely it. Thank you for saying that. Like, <laughs> but because it applies to so many different aspects of life. People who start using drugs. People who you know, like at at, at parties and stuff. Um, I saw this so many times. Um, people, or people who fall into destructive patterns of like gambling on uh, sports betting. Um, yeah. People who fall into whatever it is. It's like we are in on something that the rest of them are not. Yeah. Um, the that's, rest that's of those the... normies. The rest of those fucking the sheep. The sheep. Yeah. Yeah, and I I, I track this a bit once because i was thinking about this cult-like aspect with bitcoin like several years back and the crypto scene was nothing that it's like like five years ago so it was basically just bitcoin that was out there but the people were like they were fanatical about it and they yeah. were were really really into it in a way that that a healthy person shouldn't be into money in any form but right. it, it turns out that it's um at that time it was more of a subculture and they had their millionaires there for sure. But there's one one like glaring mistake that people usually make is that they, they get sad that they didn't get in on Bitcoin early because they have the, the false idea that if they bought, bought a thousand Bitcoin when they were worth one dollar, they would have kept them until now when it's worth 25,000. Used to be worth 40,000 just a month ago, but that's a different discussion. But it's not like they wouldn't have sold all of them when where they were when they were worth let's say 20 euros a piece so it's it's like not a lot of people actually got them originally and held to them by choice but there's a bunch of people who found an old hard drive and they noticed that okay bitcoin is selling for five thousand dollars a piece and i've actually got twenty thousand bitcoins on this old hard drive that i mined with my laptop in 2011 or so when it was still possible so so those those gamblers or, or lucky people however you want to want to call them uh, those examples are being used currently because uh, a lot of 
a lot of these initial coin offerings make the same promise that this coin, this crypto coin, this exact crypto coin will be worth more than Bitcoin in, in a couple of years. And now you have the chance to get in early. So that's the that's the pyramid scheme part of it that really troubles me because most of them will fail. Absolutely. And I'm still waiting for the, the actual real world, world use for this stuff because now it seems that Bitcoin is used for speculation, which is like 75% of all Bitcoin traffic, which means it's legal traffic, which of course the crypto bros say that Bitcoin is mostly used for legal stuff. And then there's the actual applications of the currency, which is mostly now uh, buying drugs, buying guns, paying ransom. And that seems to be the the, <laughs> the, the, the market that demands, demands this stuff. But we'll see. I'm not entirely dismissing the whole phenomenon i'm just criticizing its current implementation we'll see where it goes because there is as you said there's promise in decentralized finance and it has a good possibility to actually do good for the world and mm. this might be just growing pains and i, I don't want to seem like I'm, I'm saying that it's never going to amount to anything but its current iteration is is clearly clearly has a lot of it a lot of problems that should be addressed and uh I don't know if, if regulation on giving financial advice is the one because that only applies to Australians. Mm. And basically me telling you not to invest in Bitcoin is financial advice. And let's say I'm not at all qualified to do that. I don't think anyone, you know, if it were simple as invest or don't invest, um, and yeah. it wouldn't be an issue. But it's, the, you know, all these schemes and scams and whatever other unsavory things look i just want to mm -hmm. um i want to wrap up uh by shifting gears back to the um some of the stuff we we're talking about at the beginning of the conversation um which is you know uh like hacks and different attacks of that nature so talk to me i'm like and you're gonna have to excuse my poor Finnish pronunciation, but the <laughs> Vestamo Psychiatry Clinic cyber attack. What first that was of all, actually how you, first of all, how do you pronounce it? Second of all, yeah. what was it? And you know, um, let's you know talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you actually did a did a pretty good job of it. It's it's pronounced <laughs> Vastamo, okay. and uh, that yeah, Vastamo is a. Uh, well, was a chain of psychotherapy clinics that was founded in 2008 in Finland, and their their idea was to to have uh, this national chain of low barrier of entry psychotherapy clinics that people could go to to get psychotherapy, basically. So they were operating 22 different locations uh, in nine years after they were founded, and they were bought in 2019 by outside investors. Uh, with a with a pretty pretty big price, I think it was the tune of about ten million mm. or so, and they were running running this this business in Finland. They had over two hundred therapists working for them, mm. and of course, as a result, so a lot of patients. But in in October of twenty twenty one, it became public that they had been breached, and they they had been storing all of their patient records including therapists notes like written notes that they make of every every appointment as required by law because your therapist might change but the notes will follow you so that you can continue the work with the new therapist but they were they were breached and an attacker started publicly extorting them for money and they said that they had in their possession the the Therapeutic, therapeutic patient record, records of over 30,000 30, Finnish people, which turned out to be true later on. So, Jesus. Uh, yeah. yeah so that private psychiatric records of people? Yes, exactly. Everything everything they told their therapist was written down in those notes. Well, and the attackers I guess, had those. But what are you going to do with I mean, I guess if someone says that, like, you know, they broke the law and it's obviously embarrassing and deeply personal and should never be shared with anyone. And there's, you know, yeah. like a, not attorney client privilege, whatever, a confidential privileged information. But yeah. what, what's the threat? Like, we're going to send this to your boss that you were talking shit about. The, or like, Well, the threat was of making it all public. Like, we're just going to put this all in the Internet to, for everyone to download. 
So right. that was the threat. And when, when a lot of people go to a therapist and they have issues, they, of course, talk about their most deeply held secrets to them just mm. to work through those issues. Yeah. It's it's not like not like you go there and just don't tell anything to them. And they, they make notes yeah. of all of it. So so basically the attacker was, was extorting Vastamo. To just put it up all on the internet in a, yeah, a exactly. publicly accessible thing. That's yeah. fucked up. Yeah. We should get Extremely. a hobby. Like, stop. <laughs> like, what? That's like that's bad. That's pretty bad. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds... it's it's a it's a it's a extremely depraved form of crime to get, let's say, extort the mentally ill with their secrets. I think it's it. That's why yes. it probably sent. Yeah, that, yes. Yeah, that's that's probably why it sent such a shockwave through Finland because we're a country of about five and a half million people. So if you take thirty thousand random Finns, everybody knows somebody. At least they know somebody who knows somebody who went there and whose secrets are now being used as as extortion material by a criminal. Well, so what so, happened? What's the next chapter? Sorry, I well, should shut up. No, that's fine. So, <laughs> so for full disclosure, at that time I was working for Nixu, which is a Finnish cybersecurity company. I was the head of digital forensics and incident response there. So our job was to to assess and respond and report and help help with breaches and and different kinds of cyber attacks. And and Vastama reached out to us and asked us for help. And what we did was I was. Well, I was running that investigation. I was the the head of head of the technical part of it. So I called up my my old contacts at the police and the National Cybersecurity Center, and we started collaborating with them. And this is all now public knowledge, so I'm, I'm I, I can talk about this. And they Bastamo came out and mentioned us us as their partner. So we did a technical investigation of the server that was breached. It was their their ERP. I'm spacing on what's that short for, but they had the patient registry on on a single server that was found out to be inadequate, inadequately protected. <clears throat> Basically, it had a had a database access port open to the internet with no authentication, which meant that anybody could just stroll in and download the records. So that's what the technical investigation found out. Uh, the criminal investigation was. A separate issue and since I wasn't working with the police I'm not privy on the details to that and they are quite tight-lipped about it but there was a lot of stuff happening in the public because the attacker was communicating in the public so they started first releasing a hundred patient records every day just to get put pressure on Vastama to pay them but they didn't budge how much did they want uh, I think it was something like half a million euros why don't you just pay him that's not that much well, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That's like, a really good. The, why didn't one of the many wealthy investors or wealthy people in Finland well, just pay the guy and let him fuck right off? Well, then it comes down to the same question that a lot of ransomware victims are going to ask themselves: that Should we pay? And I, I think. Oh, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. There's the there's the old Bush Bush attitude. I think we're not going to negotiate with an attacker like this because there's no guarantee that they will be good to their promise. So they get half a million from you, and then they ask for a half a million more, or two million, or or whatever. So so the the safest bet there is just not to negotiate with them and just go to the police. Uh, there's always the possibility that they would have paid and and got them the attacker to shut up, but that wouldn't really have absolved them of the issue because the the data was already out there and the attacker made it public they they posted about it on a on a bunch of finnish forums and just contacted press and everything so it had all the hallmarks of an amateur attack because if you have this kind of a situation it's it's not probably in your best interest to have the press involved because that's going to put a lot of pressure on the on the victim also i'm not giving tips here for criminals just trying to get, <laughs> trying to uh, paint a picture of how these operations usually are run. Yeah, just make notes so you can stop the journalism game and just start extorting. <laughs> keep it in mind. But, yeah, but they were un- unsuccessful eventually in that and, and Vastamo didn't pay. And I, I think that's the only long-term solution to this kind of criminality is to never pay, even though mm. it, 
it might be a good short-term solution, but then again, you're dealing with somebody that you ultimately can't even begin to trust. So that's that's not usually but, a viable but option. But you said before that the ransomware companies built up their reputation on being men of their yes. word. That's true, but then you are dealing with a professional group, and this uh, didn't seem like that at all. They didn't uh, use any of like, the, yeah, yeah. Right. And then this they, seemed what, like, do you think they were Finnish? Where do you think they were from? Or you were not at liberty to speculate? I can speculate for sure. I, I think, in my opinion, that they showed a lot of understanding of Finnish culture and Finnish in internet culture. And they were able to pick out Finnish members of parliament from the data and, and release those as proof that they have have data on patients from all walks Jesus. of life. And yeah, they they clearly had had a had a it's an understanding that would be very difficult to acquire if you're not Finnish. Isn't so there just, a collective responsibility of like say you release private data on MPs, right? Yeah. Would it, shouldn't Finnish newspapers refuse to print that? Like and yeah, I mean they didn't or, yeah. They didn't print that but they they put that data on on for example Ulilauta which is a sort of a 4chan like board image board same same format different content uh but anyway they they posted it there originally and i'm pretty sure that nobody outside of finland knows what ylilauta is but everybody in finland knows what it is at least those who but are but shouldn't familiar. normal civil like i mean i don't know i think of well, finnish people as like everyone's nice maybe <laughs> i mean you know it's nice everyone's slapping no, each no, other you're, in the you're back it's Scandinavian, confusing us yeah. with the canadians <laughs> no like i mean but I, I I don't know if I like I would think that some people would be like oh I'm not going to go look at that but right once it's out there it's yeah. out there and even yeah. if yeah and it spreads like wildfire and then I'm sure there's people saying you know making fake copies of the notes and saying here are the notes and blah 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 even if you scrub it off mm. the internet like you can never get it really yeah off. you can never so I understand yeah. why it's an issue I've yeah, I've I've I didn't mean to sorry. I need to be quiet. So what happened next? <laughs> so what no. happened after this? No, no, I, I appreciate the input and questions because you're you're helping me go through the story, but uh, but the data data on the internet is like mixing ink with water. You can never get it all out. It just it's not just possible. It's so trivial to copy, and the the amount of data wasn't that big, like the text records. There was thirty thousand text files which was mm. spread out and they they released a hundred of them first as an example just trying to apply pressure to Vastamo which didn't work so they said that we're going to release a hundred more the next day and a hundred more the next day and I think on the fourth day the attackers made a mistake and instead of packaging a hundred patient files and, and putting that online for people to download and stare at they actually accidentally packaged their home folder from the attacker server which meant that they released a bunch of data that they were not supposed to release including all the patient files and a bunch of people were able to download a copy of that file and go through its contents and and somebody got a hold of all the patient records and in a extremely psychopathic move created a search engine that you can actually go to that's on the Tor network and search those patient records. So it's not just downloadable text files. It's a it's a fucking web page that you can use to view them. So that's what ended per, up happening. Per, per person, you can search up yeah. people's names. And yeah, or, or whatever. Engine designed ex specifically for this purpose. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, fucked Some, up. that's like beyond fucked up. <laughs> what yeah. the fuck? Yeah, well, that's the internet for you. So... I don't know. I, I don't know what's the motivation behind that. Some some kind of hatred for humanity, I guess. But after that, they cut all contact with Vastamo and stopped trying to extort them. But the next move that they did was that they contacted each patient individually via email and tried to extort money from the patients directly. So they were asking for 200 euros to remove your data from this data set. So that was the... Uh, sort of the other avenue of attack that didn't really work because the security community in Finland started contacting all the victims and, and people and, and trying to get them first 
not to pay and if they pay just tell us and give us the bitcoin wallet so that we could do some some uh, threat intelligence on it and see and it this turned out to be by the numbers the biggest criminal case in finland 27000 criminal complaints were filed to the helsinki police department on this issue and Actually, I'm not sure it was if it was the Helsinki PD or what, but the police received 27,000 complaints, and I think the the total net gain for the attacker was a few thousand euros. Mm. So, amazingly small amount of money made with this this really really big attack against, well, not even a company and not even a patient, but even just it, it was an against attack against trust towards digital systems i think in general and we're still every every cybersecurity lecture or or presentation starts with with an example of vastamo and saying that how we are avoiding this so at least it brought a lot of attention to the healthcare systems and their cybersecurity and how to protect them because in this situation it was just I don't know the details. I didn't do the criminal investigation or even the civil litigation. I just did the technical part. I didn't even do that personally. My team did that, but I was the head of investigation. So I know exactly what happened on the server, but I don't know what the people were thinking. I haven't interviewed anyone or, or would even like to. So that's somebody else's job. So uh, I, I won't speculate on motives or, or who's guilty or who did what. That's outside the scope. But what I know is that the impact has been pretty big because it really raised the barrier of Finns to go into therapy and the barrier was already pretty high with the national national mindset of of if you talk about your problems then then that's a that's a sign of weakness to just shut up and bear with it and maybe get drunk every once in a while and stare out at a lake it seems yeah. to be the favorite method of of dealing with your issues that i mean the effect that that would have on just collective consciousness health of the country i mean unimaginable like that to lose faith in something like psychological psychiatric services yeah is i mean what kind of monster would do this like um maybe, yeah i mean it go, but it goes to show something which is that people should think about the second and third and fourth order effects of what they do but like maybe this this guy was just an opportunist or girl or whoever a group or just you know an opportunist who was like i want to make some money they didn't think yeah. about oh we're gonna fuck up the whole country's national psyche by making it so that people aren't comfortable going to no. seek therapy and counseling but you know thinking about the second and third order effects of things is you know i don't know maybe we'd all benefit from doing that yeah and i think some some let's say personality abnormalities are here at play because even even among criminals there is is certain limits that they they usually don't like to go go above uh, go beyond and i, I think this this was a surprisingly depraved attack and preying on on the very very weak and because they they had a lot of children's psychotherapy rec records there like underage people and what? that was just they, they weren't stripped away from there and it had everybody's social security number there too so those are are being used to this day in identity theft because the whole system with those is broken there's a academic discussion to be had how to actually use that but uh, some web shops and lenders they they use it just to identify you and say if you have your social security number then that's authentication enough for us to know that it's you because obviously well we have better options but it takes time and money to implement those so so identity theft is one issue and and losing all your secrets is another and especially if you've done something something that you really really want to keep out of the public well that's sure that's, yeah it's so kind you of, cheated on your partner you know yeah whatever or stole, secretly, stole from yeah. work or or whatever there are a lot of i haven't read read the actual files i did some analysis based on them just timelines and things like that and trying to determine the time of the attack which meant that i had to touch them as as um part of the the technical analysis of the server but 
didn't really go into into reading the actual stories, but you can just imagine what kinds of things people tell to their therapists. Like, mm. just you can start with sexual stuff, but and then just go deeper into into anything. Yeah, of course. And all, all that is yeah, all that being used to to ransom somebody. And uh, we were able to take a bit bit of a backstage peek into the attack by analyzing the the home folder that the attacker accidentally shared with the world and we could see that they had scanned thousands of similar mysql database servers and they had tried to attack them just using this method called brute force which is just flinging shit to the wall and see what sticks so basically i have a list of most common credentials passwords Hmm. uh usernames and then you just try to log on with those and one of the passwords is just blank and one of the usernames is root which is the the root user the the super admin of the the database it turns out that on this list we could find the server's ip address the username root and a blank password and that was enough to just get in there and my speculation is that they they downloaded the database a long time ago and they downloaded hundreds of databases probably looking for credit cards or or usernames or passwords or whatever they could make profit out of and then at one time they realized that they actually have the patient records of a big company and it took them many months to realize this after actually stealing the data because i think i'm pretty confident we were able to pinpoint the time that it was stolen i don't know if the, if, if that's public so i'm not going to mention it but it, there was a there was a significant delay between stealing the actual database and starting the extortion and I think that just shows that it, it wasn't a targeted a- attack. And uh, it, it had all the hallmarks of, a, of an amateur extortionist. Because like I mentioned, um, these brand names that a lot of these groups operate under, they're very professional with this stuff, like scarily professional. And they, they have infrastructure in place and they have, have instructions. And the first thing that they do is contact the company and tell them that we've, we've attacked you and some companies notice it when they start trying to use their IT systems and everything's encrypted and they have a ransom note on their desktop so they contact the attackers and they usually try to handle this privately first. And now they, they start, they've started to release lists of victims and there's a ticker there so you have like five days to pay or 100 gigabytes of your stuff is going public. So there's a there's another level of publicity there, but this this was just posting on on shit posting image boards about this attack and and contacting press and and doing all that stuff, and then being extremely unprofessional in the execution of the crime, which in my opinion points towards an amateur that just ran into this data by chance and and he's he's, he's trying to make a quick buck and failed at that. But this is all speculation. I haven't done the actual criminal investigation and won't do it. It's the National Bureau of Investigations that's doing it in Finland. And I really hope that they are able to catch the attacker. It's been a couple of years now and it still hasn't still hasn't been been an arrest on this case, but I, I trust that the police are making at least some progress. I, w- I mean, I would hope that they are. Uh, given the nature of the crime more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm moved by this and I'm, yeah, I don't have a dog in the fight other than, you know, common decency and humanity. Like, yeah. Um, anyway, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was just saying that it was, this was emotionally quite taxing also cause, cause just thinking about, especially the children that really got to me. Like I'm, I, I feel for the adults, that are are in distress and are looking for help and get their trust betrayed in this way and and such a deprived act of of crime but but just the underage kids and i and knowing that their their peers in school are able to access this data and bully them over it and that just 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 kind of broke me one day when i was working with this for a while but then i gathered myself and continued the investigation so that's that's what we do we try to just shed light into the events and and try to trying to find what we can and hopefully make the world a bit better than it was than than before we started and i think just just circling back to the motivation part and that's 
those are actually the moments that I feel in my current profession as a cybersecurity professional is like when when you can actually help a company or or people because companies are just groups of people to identify a problem and then fix it and then they're grateful of, of it and they can just go back to things as they were before the attack that's right. really motivating in itself because because I, I don't i don't work on a commission so i just get get a salary <laughs> but yeah. but that's the that's the that's the motivation the puzzles and the of course the, the thrill of the detective work just finding out something and just getting to the bottom of things but we're still not at the bottom of this attack as we don't still we still don't have a name for the attacker at least it's not publicly known it might be known to the police i don't know i have no idea but i sure as hell hope it is mm. i hope so too from sydney i hope so <laughs> um, well i'm sure you'll read about it in in the local news 